They must cultivate their families. Yuzakihin, they must purify them, Yurabbihim, and also cultivate them, grow them, charge them, counsel them, watch them, cultivate them. They must advise their husbands, Adina Nasiha. They conform to his orders, to his pleasure, but they also advise him. Especially at the time of Fajr. You Muslim ladies, you must become people of Fajr. Because if you are people of Fajr, then you have the right to advise your husband and chase him out of the house at the time of Fajr. Wake him up, aggravate him. Say to him, brother, you don't want to go to the masjid and pray? Subhanallah, Habibi, 27, 27 rewards you would get for, for us. No, no, get up out of the bed, go and pray. Subhanallah, what's wrong with you? And then, if he doesn't get up, go and get some water. You see? And uh, throw some water on him and then run and close the door. <laughs> he will be angry that you did that. But once he gets the habit of performing the Fajr, he will love you for that. So become women of the Fajr. Also, when you want to advise your husbands, advise him in a nice way. Say to him, don't say, oh, you know, you always say you're going to do this, you're going to do that. You don't never do what you say. No, tell him, say, Ya Habibi, listen, you know, did you ever, did you read this hadith? I had read this hadith from the Prophet wasallam. You know, I was reading this ayah of Quran, and I was wondering, did you know the tafsir of this ayah? Oh, you know, I was reading this book of fiqh, and I didn't quite understand this terminology. What do you think it means over here? You see, oh, you know, I was just thinking, I was supposed to buy something and I didn't remember, did you pay me the dowry? <laughs> you know, in a nice way. So the man, subhanallah, he will know how you're reminding him and he will not mind. But you should not be very badgering. but you should advise them. The woman must participate in the society. You have responsibilities in the society. Your responsibility is not just for yourself and is not just for your home. You must think about your neighborhood. What has happened? I think the, I think the battery's going flat. Don't worry, I will talk. Can you hear me, sisters? Yeah. Very good. Let me bring the water here, inshallah. You must participate in the society. You must ask your neighbor, see what their condition is. Look across the road, look down the road. See who your neighbors are on your way to the shop, on your way to work, see who they are. The five neighbors on this side, on that side, in front of you, in back of you, find out their names so that you can serve them. You can know them. If your street is cluttered, there's something dangerous, you should report it. You should be involved in your parent-teacher association. You should be involved in the neighborhood council. You should be knowing what's going on, who's coming, going, who should not be in the neighborhood. You should be watching. Not just in other people's business, but looking out into the issues which is part of your business. Participate in the society. Don't just be looking at the TV looking in the magazines, looking on something for your own self, looking in the refrigerator, only looking to see, going window shopping for yourself, for your children. No, be concerned about your neighbor because the Prophet Wasallam on his deathbed, when he was dying, Jibreel Wasallam kept coming to him, asking him about the neighbor. So much so the Prophet Wasallam he said he thought maybe that the neighbor had a right to his inheritance. Ask about your neighbor. Get to know your neighbor. 
interact with your neighbor, when your neighbor has a concern for you, when you have concern for your neighbor, respect for your neighbor, you will find the neighbor will have concern and respect for you. Then the neighbor will see Islam through you. Be involved in your society. Be an example for other women. Compete with other women in taqwa, in knowledge, in adab, in sacrifice, in seeking knowledge. Be example for other women. Compete with each other. Have Quran memorizing circles. 10, 15 sisters get together once a month or twice a month in another sister's house and they compete with each other to memorize Quran to memorize a hadith of the Prophet They discuss with each other ways and means of perfecting their hijab, dealing with their children, dealing with issues. Be an example for your children. The woman that sleeps through the fajr or doesn't perform her prayers, generally speaking, her family, they also will do the same. The woman who watches a lot of TV, her family will do the same. The woman that is selfish, she will raise a selfish family. The woman is the first university. What she teaches the family, in most cases, the family will never unlearn it. They will carry it the rest of their lives. Secure, functional knowledge. Sisters, before you start learning, you know, sometimes sisters, they want to learn. I want to memorize the whole Quran. Sisters make this, they say, this is my objective, my goal. I want to memorize the whole Quran. But the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu they used to memorize 10 ayats and then act upon it. And then learn 10 ayats and act upon it. So all of us should want to memorize the Quran, but memorize it like that. So your knowledge becomes functional. Memorize Juz al-Amma and the tafsir of it from Ibn Kathir and the Asbab al-Nuzul how those, why those ayats were revealed under what circumstances. Memorize the Arba'in ahadith of Imam Nawawi and then get the explanation of it from some ulama or fuqaha. Then after that, go on to issues of usul, usul fiqh. Understand the seerah of the Prophet Wasallam. Understand issues relative to your salah and your tahara. This is functional knowledge. Obtain that first before you go on to more difficult things. Obtain the very best education that you can. Shame on us living in the West where you have access to education and the Muslim ladies, they don't take advantage of it. And even you don't have to leave from your home in many cases to obtain a degree. This is what you need to know also. Today with the internet, someone said, on the internet, there are more than 716 different degrees that a woman can earn without even leaving her home. Subhanallah. Secondly, fulfill your Islamic duties. Your Islamic duty between yourself and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Your Islamic duty to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi Your Islamic duty to the leader of the Muslims. Your Islamic duty to your husband. Your Islamic duty to your family, your Islamic duty to the community, your Islamic duty to one another. Guard your tongues. There's nothing more destructive for Muslim women than the tongue. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said to a group of men and women, if you guarantee me two things, I will guarantee you paradise. He said, the tongue and the private parts. And one time when the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi was passing through his masjid and there was a group of women sitting there, he said, Oh women, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala allowed me to look into the hellfire. And I saw that most of its inhabitants, many of its inhabitants, there was women. And those women asked him, how come you said that? He said, because many of them, they, they, they gossip and they talk too much. And they are ungrateful to their husbands. So that when their husband gives them something, and spent all, everything on them, they say, oh, shukran, jazakallah khairan. But when they are angry with him, they say, oh, you never did nothing for me. <laughs> and they are also given to gossip. 
tail bearing, using the telephone, you know, telephone, tell a woman. There's two ways of communication. Telephone and tell a lady. Why? Because you have more time. You're more provocative. The men, they do the same thing, but in different ways. But because when you do it, it is more dangerous because you stand between the men and the children. Guard your tongues. The Prophet ﷺ said, let him who believes in Allah in the last day either say what's good or keep quiet. So when you see sisters talking foolishness, say, sister, listen, if you don't have nothing good to say, my suggestion for you is, what's good? Keep quiet. This is what the Prophet ﷺ said, don't be angry with me. Also, initiate da'wah among the women. I will tell you a statistic. 108,000, somewhere around that figure, people became Muslims between Great Britain, North America, and Australia last year. 108,000. And I will tell you that 63% of them were women. This means about 69,000 women. The other statistic I want to share with you is that the opportunities to give da'wah among women are greater than the opportunities among men because women, they don't have the same level of ego. Women have vanity, but men, they have ego. And vanity is different from ego. Ego is like climbing up a mountain, going through a steel wall. Vanity is a matter of logistics. And women, they can penetrate the vanity of another woman. But sometimes it's very difficult to penetrate the ego of a man. And this is why I find that women tend that when you tell them they're doing something that is wrong and they see it is very clearly wrong and silly, they have a tendency to accept it and change. Men, they get an attitude. Why are you talking to me like that? They don't want to change. They don't want to get angry. They don't want to fight. So take the opportunity to initiate da'wah so that we men, we don't have to do that because there's a special fitna for the men who have to give dawah for the women. We have to do it. If the sisters, they don't do it. But that's not our job. And there's, there's a great liability for doing that. And I tell the brothers, if you can avoid doing direct dawah to sisters, leave it alone. Leave it for the sisters. Or if a woman is interested, send her to your wife. Uh, as long as the, the wife don't think she's going to become another wife. If that's the case, send it to somebody else. But you sisters have a rare opportunity to participate in the da'wah. We're going to come back to that topic a little bit later on. Don't worry. I know some of you is thinking why he said that. We're going to come back to the issue about the other wife later, inshallah. Initiate the da'wah among the women because that's your job. Because I believe I believe that the da'wah, more so than any other element, will contribute towards the Islamization of this society and this civilization. Because through the da'wah, we can enter the hearts, we can penetrate the minds, we can capture the whole family. And once people become Muslims, you don't think they're going to drop bombs on their own cities. They're not going to put their own children in Guantanamo Bay or Belmarsh or whatever prison they have here. No, so we should give the da'wah because the da'wah is the imperceptible way of communication. We can capture hearts, we can capture minds for Islam, and in some cases it is irresistible. Promote resource development. 
Muslims today need resources. We need human resources. We need material resources. And we Muslims need to concentrate on strategies for developing resources. And since I already spoke about the issue that women have more money than men, in many cases, men, women are more talented than men for certain things. See how the sisters have organized this. If this was organized by the men, it wouldn't have, been, it wouldn't have happened on time. All the things would have not been here. Every time the sisters organize something, always it's better than the men. Whenever there is a masjid or an organization that has the participation of the men, they have a much better chance of being successful. When the women are not there, usually you find the men going to be stagnant, dark, not without coordination. They miss all the little small things. They don't cross the T's, they don't dot the I's, they're always forgetting things. Because the women, they're gonna make that list. You see, they're always gonna be asking, bothering us, did you do this, honey? Did you take care of that? Sister, did you so and so? They got the old listen. Men don't like to be told like that. So the brothers should take the lesson that when you have a project, make sure you got a committee of sisters, chances are that project is going to go all right. Muslim women should also be involved in defending the ummah. Learn to write, learn to speak, learn to do research. Learn to argue in the best way. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Learn to defend the ummah from poison, from enemies, from dangers, from things that we may not see coming. And finally, Muslim women, you must support community projects. And when there's an issue that needs to be addressed, do not be afraid to say this. We have to form some kind of a, uh, a think tank, a committee to deal with this issue. If the imam or the brothers don't want you to meet in the mosque, then meet in the library. Meet in your homes. If the imam don't want to meet with you, meet with his wife. If you don't have a wife, I don't know who you'll meet with then. <laughs> Give him a wife. Maybe that's his problem. Support the community projects. Because without your support, chances are the projects are going nowhere. So sisters, for this session, I have covered some of the rights and some of the responsibilities. And now I want to just, before we end the session, I want to read to you because I think it's too much information for me to read from the sources themselves. So I'm going to give you the sources. So if you would just uh, bear with me a moment. And if you have your pen, I'm going to give you some sources. One, the Muslim woman and her rights. Or if you like, I can have Brother Kashif during the uh, intermission, he can write them down and put them up on the screen. Is that better? Good. Because I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine different websites that themselves, one of them, one of these websites have over 74 different links. So I think that the contribution I'm trying to make to you is that I'm going to provide you with the resources for you to do the research to broaden this topic for yourselves, inshallah. Then when we come back after the re re recess, uh, I want to talk about some of the special problems that we have to deal with and to deal with these rights and these responsibilities. And then after that, perhaps we can have some questions and answers. Would that be appropriate? Okay. Um, Inshallah, during the questions and answers, uh, our Sheikh, uh, Sheikh Faisal, he will assist me, inshallah, um, uh, with that, uh, because it's always good uh, to have someone who has a more formal background in issues of fiqh or Islamic studies. So he will assist me in that. Uh, so uh, after the break, 
uh, we'll deal with some of the special problems, observations from my part, uh, and then after that we'll have some Q&A to uh, see if we can resolve some of the special issues uh, that you may see yourselves. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika wa nashadu wa la ilaha illa anta wa nastagfiruka wa natubu alayk. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa ala alihi wa ashabihi wa azwajihi wa man wala wa ba'd wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu Dear Muslim sisters, thank you very much for your uh, patience and um, tolerance uh, for us to be able to synchronize the uh, technical issues here, insha'Allah. Uh, the other thing is that um, we will try not to go much beyond the allotted time um, to complete our task, insha'Allah. Uh, before we go to the, uh, the issues of the, uh, the questions um, and their um, subsequent answers, I just want to talk about some of the problems uh, that I see in this topic that we're talking about. And I'm speaking here as a, um, I'm, trying to be, I'm trying to be objective as a father, uh, as a husband, uh, as a brother, as a, uh, a responsible Muslim. But I'm also speaking as a, um, a sociologist, a person um, having some background and um, special um, involvement and training in the field of sociology. So when I speak about some of these problems, um, someone else may review them from a fiqh point of view. And as these questions come, I can already see that many of these questions, uh, I'm, people are asking me questions as if I have the capacity to be able to answer these from a fiqhi or ahkam point of view. I do not, and I will not, uh, because there are people in your locale, people that are here in your country, in your area, your city, who have the qualifications, even if they are not willing, and even if they are not accessible sometimes, I should not do that because I don't have their qualification. The second thing uh, is that I am steering you towards references that are reliable, um, that are reputable, and that are accessible. So many of the questions that some sisters are asking, you're going to find it when you go to these references. So this is not going to be a shake and bake deal that you're just going to write some questions and Khalid is going to take the responsibility to answer them or Sheikh Faisal is going to do that. No, you're going to do some work and we're going to do some work. So if there is a way for me to be able to respond to this from my background, familiarity, I will do that. The Sheikh will also help me. But if I choose not to answer a question, it is because you will find the answers in the references that I'm giving to you. Because five or six of these references, they are websites of people who themselves can give fatawa. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَاسْأَلُهُ أَهْلِ ذِكْرْ إِن كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ Ask the people of the dhikr. It means the people of the dhikr. The dhikr means Quran and Sunnah. Ask the people of the Quran and the Sunnah. That means ask the ulama and ask the fuqaha if you don't know. So some of the special problems. One, and I'm just going to deal with 10 of the most obvious problems that there are relative to Muslim ladies seeking their rights and fulfilling their responsibilities, uh, both in the Muslim world as well as in places where we are living as minorities, such as Australia. Number one, the first problem is 
social and political contradictions within Muslim societies themselves. This is one of the major problems that we are unable in many cases to make a reference <coughs> to Muslim societies to resolve our problems because in many cases, in fact, in most cases, the social and political contradictions that exist in Muslim countries are so rampant and so staggering and so complex that we cannot even use them as a reference in many cases. I don't say we can't use scholars who are in those countries. I say that the contradictions, the social and political contradictions in the form of institutions are so contradictory that we are not able to use them as a reference. I mean contradictory towards the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet wasallam. That's one problem. The second problem that many of the rights and responsibilities of Muslim women are being subverted and resisted and denied by Muslim governments themselves. Now, I take the responsibility of saying this, so the Sheikh is not saying this, I'm saying this. And I'm saying this having visited at least 27 Muslim governments. If I was only there for a week or 10 days, I have visited them and I saw for myself what contradictions are there um, and what resistance and denial and subversion of the rights and responsibilities of Muslim women exist inside those countries. So this is the second problem. I take the responsibility of, of this myself and I don't mind. Number three, cultural and ethnic practices that eclipse and nullify the Islamic sources. People practicing cultural and ethnic issues and they are so blindly attached to those cultural and ethnic issues that when you tell them Allah said, the messenger of Allah وسلم, said, the Sharia provides, they don't even care. So it means the, the ahkam or the principle of the sunnah is completely eclipsed. You cannot see it. There's no appreciation, no application for it because the people, they prefer the cultural or the ethnic issue. It could be an ethnic prejudice or an ethnic preference. It could be a cultural practice or just some cultural aberration. Then, prevailing customs, persuasions, and personalized trends, styles that establish innovations. I'll repeat that. Prevailing, that means dominant customs, persuasions, like a sister, she asked me a question one day. After we clearly read the hadith of the Prophet about it being forbidden for women to tie their hair on top of their head and for women to be shaving and shaping the eyebrows. A sister then she wrote and said, well, Sheikh, is it all right if because I want to appear nice to my husband, if I have my eyebrows lifted? So in spite of the fact, we, want it, we still want to see if we can scout around, skirt around, subvert, we can twist it, bend it. No, the Muslim is not like that. You hear it straight, you respond to it straight. If someone owes you money, you want it counted out completely. So when Allah orders you something, you respond back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala completely. Allah mentioned in the Quran, enter into Islam kafatan. Completely, wholeheartedly. So there are dominant customs persuasions within the individual, personalized 
styles, trends that establish innovations. Sisters want to add something, a little twist to their hijabah. They want to put a little flower up here. They want to put a little split on the side of the skirt. Little things to make it a little chic, you know. Want to put a little um, Gloria Vanderbilt on it, or the other one with the cross, what's her name? You know, you sisters know the one with the cross, what's her name? You want to put a little style designer thing to it. It's not enough that you're covered, you want to be designer covered. So there are prevailing customs and persuasions and personalized trends that establish innovations. And when you establish an innovation, what you basically do is you undermine the sunnah. Then there is direct opposition and intervention by non-Muslim governments and authorities, such as what has happened in France. Direct opposition and intervention by non-Muslim governments and authorities for various Islamic practices and rights of Muslim women and the fulfillment of their responsibilities. Number six, aspersion and dialectical confusion. Aspersion means to put something in a bad light. To speak about something in so which you cause confusion in people's minds. You say something, well, you say, yeah, in the Quran, God says this, or Muhammad says this, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. However, it don't make sense. It's not even rational. So, you know, the Kafirs, this is how they talk. Or non-Muslim intellectuals say that this was done in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but we have no need to do that now because now we have modern facilities. So we have aspersion, putting it in a bad or negative light, and dialectical, meaning using words to confuse people, created by intellectuals from the Muslim community, who most of them are conservatives and non-Muslim orientalists. That is, non-Muslims who academically know more about Islam than most Muslims, but Allah blocked them from the guidance. So they are donkeys carrying books. Number seven. Resistance to the Islamic ahkam and lack of respect for the sunnah by Muslims. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, and the, and the Muslim lady, she says, walakin, however, or my situation is this, or my situation is that. Or her husband says, yeah, but however, our Allah knows best. So we resist the Islamic ruling. Or when we are given a ruling by a scholar, we're not satisfied until we go to two or three other scholars, until we find a scholar who will answer us the way we like it. Or we have a lack of respect for the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because we think that what he ordered us to do, this was back in the days of like antiquity. We say, well, you know, in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they didn't have certain uh, technological, intellectual, scientific facilities. We don't have to do that anymore because we are advanced people. Which means we are saying that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's wahi to the Prophet sallallahu was not advanced as we are today. Number eight, the preponderance, that is the preference of blind following. Is a terminology, it is called taqlid. Now, taqlid is permissible for some people, blind following of madhabs. Because if you or I, if we do not have the ability to understand from where the mujtahid got his evidence, we can follow him. Because we have to have evidence. If we don't know from where he got it from, we can follow him blindly. Why? Because we have to follow the evidence. But if we have the ability to know from where he got the evidence, we cannot blindly follow because they are not absolute. 
Imam Abu Hanifa Rahmatullah Alayhi Imam Shafi'i Imam Malik Imam Ahmed Ibn Hanbal They were not absolute and their statements are not absolute because the companions of the Prophet وسلم, they were not absolute yet they were companions of the Prophet and the companions of the Prophet وسلم, never took any one of themselves and considered their word the last word in any issue so if the companions of the Prophet وسلم, didn't accept each other as the last word on any issue but that their position was we take and we leave from everyone illa rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam we take and we leave evidence from anyone illa rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam why because from allah it is absolute from the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam it is absolute and where there is ijma'a from companions of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam it is also absolute but Imam Shafi'i, Imam Hanbal, Imam Malik, Abu Hanifa, they were not of that category, although they themselves were relying upon that kind of evidence. So when we want to use them as a doorway, as a school, as a platform, we are using them to obtain what? The evidence. We're not using them themselves as the evidence, we're using them to lead us to the evidence. So what becomes the dalil for us? What is, the, what, what is the ruling for us? The source for us? It is the evidence itself. However, some Muslims, they insist on saying, Sheikh so-and-so, Mufti so-and-so, the elders, Imam so-and-so, scholar so-and-so, and they're using that person's name or the you is using that person's opinion as a final source. And they're stuck on it and they don't care what you say. Even if you give them a stronger hadith, and even if you give them, if they give you an ayah and there has been something called nasak wal mansur, they give you an ayah which has been abrogated. And you tell them this ayah has been abrogated. They tell you, I don't care, the sheikh he told me. This is called blind following. So one of the problems is that most of the Muslims, or many of them, they are blind following. They don't care about references. Secondly, they are not only blindly following scholars, but they are also blindly following personalities. And sometimes the personalities they're following is just personalities who they like how they look. He's a singer or he's a reciter of Quran or he's a, he's an imam of the masjid. You like his beard or his turban. You know, he graduated from such a university or whatever it is. And I don't care. That's my man. That's my imam. Fixation upon personalities and blindly following scholars. Number nine. I don't want anybody to say that I, Khalid said we should not follow madhabs. I didn't say that or that we should not give the scholars their due. I didn't say that. I qualified it, inshallah. Number nine, ideologically arguing and blaming, which leads to accusations and condemning. So we have some Muslims who are so right that everybody else is wrong. We got Muslims who are Criti uh, critiques of the Muslims. So when a sister walks in the door, they look at the sister and say, oh, her hijab is not right, oh, her slippers is not right, or her dress is not right, or she didn't sit right, or she's not eating right, or her house is not right, or her children is not right, or she recited that wrong, or so and so. So we are become so much crit critiques of the Muslims that everybody becomes wrong except us or our group or our leader. This is called ideologically arguing, blaming, criticizing, leading to accusing people and giving them names. We have Muslims today who have given names for everybody. If you say something, they say, oh, he's a kutubi. Oh, he's a sururi. 
or he's a Salafi or he's a Shi'i or he's a Khariji or he is Ash'ari or he or she is this or that or he's a Mubtadi Today we have 25 or 30 different names and categories that we want to put the Muslims in. And once you put them in that category, you feel comfortable who they are. And the question then is, what category are you in? Most of the people, when they put everybody in the category, they're going to say they are Firqatun Najiyah, the rightly guided group, because that's the only one that's left. These accusations, inevitably, when people disagree with your accusations, then it leads to the final thing, which is condemnation. You wind up calling people kafirs. You wind up calling people munafiks. You wind up calling people this and calling people that. And once you start calling people these names, eventually it leads to the shedding of blood or the removing of honor. The last thing. Groups that adopt extreme behaviors and mentalities vis-a-vis -vis other Muslims and themselves. That is, they start to see themselves in some real self-righteous position. And then they begin to isolate themselves away from other Muslims and they start telling other Muslims, you can't sit with that Muslim, you can't eat with that Muslim, you, can't, uh, you take, can't take knowledge from that Muslim, you can't visit that Muslim, you can't say salam to that Muslim, you can't this, you can't say that. And eventually what happens, those people wind up in painted in their own corner. And when they get painted in their own corner, they also start breaking down in their own group and they start creating the other until there's only one person left. This is a historical pro set of problems. I'm pointing these problems out from a point of history and sociology. When you go into the sources that I have given to you, you will see the solution, the position, uh, and the evaluation, uh, and the proof of those problems. Now, uh, dear sisters, I want to just, uh, just go over these um, sites with you, and you don't have to worry about it. What we're going to do is, um, what's the name of that news, the newsletter that comes out again? Oh, just a moment, don't say it, don't say it. The brother, he wrote it for me. It's called the Wake Up Call newspaper. Um, so you will find it in the Wake Up Call newspaper. All of these will be printed for you in their next uh, edition. And also, um, the transcript of my presentation to you today, uh, we will ask them also to put it there, and also these sites. Let me just go over them with you quickly, inshallah. Uh, the first one is on the position of Muslim women or, or women in Islam and in Islamic society by Dr. And this is supposed to be Hassan Turabi. I'm sorry. Can you correct that for me, brother? Hassan Turabi? Uh, you don't have to write it, sisters, inshallah, because you're going to get it all... Um, um, corrected for you and proof, uh, I need to just to say Hassan. Dr. Hassan Turabi is a, um, um, a well-known Muslim scholar um, and he has written a very beautiful treatise on the position of women in society uh, that you will appreciate inshallah. And uh, this happens to be his um, field of expertise also. Um, the next one is the Rights and Duties of Women, and this is a 24-page booklet by Dr. Suhaib Hassan. Uh, mashallah, uh, he's on our Board of Trustees, and also uh, he has written many other little small books called Introduction to the Science of Hadith. Uh, um, many good small books he has written. Uh, he's the Imam of Masjid, um, Masjid Tawheed in London. Um, the Rights and Duties of Women. The, the third one is uh, Women's Role in Contemporary Society. This is written by um, a Muslim sister, uh, and I found it to be, mashallah, very well written and a, a good reference. Uh, number, I can't seem to find number four here. Or is there a four? Maybe not. Uh, young Muslim and Female in America by a sister by the name of Anissa Nadir. 
a sister who was basically writing her experience being young, Muslim, and female in America and the challenges that are involved. Uh, interaction between men and women on the internet, Sheikh Salman Auda. Um, you will find his fatawa available on uh, a website called um, uh, Islam Today. Um, Sheikh Salman Auda. Women in the Quran and Sunnah by Professor Abdurrahman Doi. Mashallah, um, a very capable and um, um, prestigious Muslim scholar who has written many things uh, on social and political issues relative to women. Uh, hijab in the Quran and the Sunnah, another very beautiful uh, a research paper that has been prepared. And uh, you will be able to access these by just putting, going into Google and uh, putting in the titles themselves. Um, not gaggle, but Google. Uh, the Muslim woman and her rights. Um, and again, by Islamic World, islamicworld.net, a sister site, um, a very beautiful site also. Um, niqab, according to the Quran and Sunnah, www.everymuslim.com and uh, for the sisters who uh, don't know what the terminology niqab means it means uh, the part of the hijab which covers the face and also includes the wearing of the gloves um, uh, which is uh, a part of uh, the sunnah of the Prophet wasalam, and justified by his sunnah and, and authentic ahadith niqab according to the Quran and sunnah Women in Society, again by Professor Abdurrahman Doi. Make Way for the Women. Uh, another very good uh, article that uh, I read and I thought that you sisters would appreciate. Women in Society, www.allahuakbar.net. The Quran and Women, www.quranicteachings. I kind of think that is .co.uk. Uh, so if you don't mind here, I'm going to put a dot here because usually that should be a dot. But uh, well, the brother here have to do that. You see, I'm not that technologically uh, advanced. Uh, the Islamic Movement and Women's Activity. A very extensive, um, socially and politically written um, uh, uh, research paper um, written by Dr. or Sheikh Yusuf Qardawi, who is the convener or the chairman of the uh, the Fiqh Committee for Europe. Um, and most of us know Sheikh Yusuf Qardawi from one of his very famous books, Halal and Haram fil Islam, and many other books that he has written. Uh, number 16, and uh, this one uh, is a very special one. Uh, because this particular one, it has about 55 or 60 different links. Muslim women's homepage, Muslim women in the Sunnah. So I think, sisters, that inshallah, if you will make reference to these, um, uh, if you will go to these references and use them, uh, I think, inshallah, many of the questions that you're going to ask me uh, can be answered. So. From this uh, point, what we'll do is we'll try to start to um, respond to some of these questions. Now, some of them, the, are these the ones? What I've done was the, most of the questions, if the sisters went to the sites, um, all of these questions would probably be answered. Yes. So we've let that for the sites. Sisters to, uh, sisters to sorry, uh, investigate and research themselves. Jazakallah khair. And these ones are more socially related. And, um, which okay, so I'll deal with these, and if I think, and if I think I cannot deal with them, I'll hand them back to Sheikh Faisal here. Uh, the first question says, uh, domestic violence is becoming an issue among the Muslim community. Too many of the victims, uh, they find it hard to talk to Muslims, fearing people will talk. At the same time, they fear to go to certain government groups because their advice are not according to Islam. Please advise us of what to do in such situations. <clears throat> I think that um, it's necessary here first, always exhaust, exhaust the availability and the accessibility of 
the Muslims of responsibility. I mean, if there are 15 or 20 masjids in this city where the prayer is being led and where Jum'ah prayer is being given, if there's a problem a sister she has and she cannot get it done, uh, fixed or resolved in her locale, she needs to go with her mahram to every place where there is some residue of Islamic responsibility or authority until she gets it resolved. Now it may take a long time to do it, but I'll just remind you of this, that some of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, they traveled for months and years just to get a authentication for a hadith. So don't look for a shake and bake answer. Don't look for something, a phone call, or just somebody going to send you a fatwa over the internet and make an appointment, you're going to go there and they're going to give you a stamp and a seal and that's it. No. If it's something that you want and you need, sometimes, sister, you're going to have to stand in line. You're going to have to be frustrated. You're going to have to go and wait somewhere all day long and the people don't answer you or whatever it is. It may take you a year just to get the issue resolved. If you don't get it resolved by going through that procedure, Shame on the Muslim leaders. Shame on them. Your next recourse, I would suggest for you, is that you go outside of that locale, seeking people who have a reputation for responding to these kinds of issues, who have written on these kinds of issues, who may have websites are giving fatawa on these kinds of issues, have your situation certified. That means what you understand it to be, have it certified by witnesses. Write it down and have seals put towards it. And then send it to a mufti. Now it may take three months, four months, whatever, for them to read it, get back to it, and send it back to you or whatever. But if a mufti responds to you with a certified fatwa, it is the same as if he was in your locale. Even though that fatwa may not be able to be executed because usually when a mufti gives a fatwa the government has another area of the government that executes it like a judge he gives a judgment in the court right but the police they execute it he makes a judgment somebody goes to jail he makes a judgment something is dissolved but unfortunately when a mufti from another place gives a fatwa there's nobody to execute it sometimes but at least you have the fatwa in front of you. That's one way. Another way is that Muslim sisters and Muslim men should form research groups, help support groups that sit down with individuals and hear their situation and, and hold it in confidence. And then write it up for them, write a synopsis for them, and then filter it to the people of responsibility so that what I just mentioned can be done. Now, this is a long process, but it is one of the processes which you're going to have to learn to resort to because we are not living in ideal circumstances. And sisters, let me just remind you of something I said previously. Even if you were living in a Muslim country, you may still not have access to do what I'm telling you. So don't think because you're living in Australia, somebody say, I wish I was living in a Muslim country, these Kafirs, so and so and so. No, maybe if you were living in a Muslim country, you find it even more difficult. So I'm just trying to give you some suggestions. The other thing is my suggestion for all of you is that your families should be attached to a student of knowledge or to a scholar or to someone who themselves um, are closely attached to students of knowledge or a scholar. Why? Because if your family is attached to that kind of a person, you are learning from that kind of a person, that person can facilitate that knowledge for you better than anyone else. But this means that you have to become accountable to that person. You can't use that person like a doorknob. Oh, I'm going to see Sheikh so-and-so, I'm going to see Sheikh so-and-so. And the only time you go to see them or respect them is when you want something. No. If you go to that person and your family is attached to that person, you should become accountable to that person for your knowledge 
so that if there's something wrong with you or your family, they can advise you and you will correct yourself. So it's a two-way street here. Sorry, Sheikh Khalid. Just on this issue, um, on a different perspective, concerning domestic violence, it's uh, very advisable for any lady who is uh, to actually take measures before it comes to that situation of violence. Mm. Um, now, violence, I'm not sure she's just mentioned domestic violence, which it can be broken down into physical, emotional, mm. and those sort of things. But I think uh, what we should keep in mind is before a situation actually leads to uh, physical violence or any such kind, you need to see someone about that, mm. whether it's the family or the sheikh that's um, connected to your family. Before it leads to such a situation, the sister should have the courage, inshallah, to actually address the situation before it um, goes out of control. Exactly. And leads to a situation where we need to go to the courts, we need to go to the law and non-Muslim institutions. So inshallah, just keep that in mind. Um, we need to solve the problem before it reaches that uh, uh, situation. Okay, so uh, the next question is, uh, is emotional neglect a valid reason for khula? That is, the husband does not uh, uh, ask about the wife's emotional feelings. No, this is, not, uh, this is not a fundamental reason for khula. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had told you to be patient. How you just, uh, you, 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 your husband, he makes you cry. Your husband, he makes you sad. He doesn't give you the warmth or the love that you think that you expect and you want khula? No, this is not a justifiable reason. I have to remind you, sisters, that there are women who, because they want to preserve the integrity of their marriage and their children and their home, that they live with a man and they undergo his... Uh, 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 the inconveniences or insults or other things or even he doesn't satisfy them uh, or whatever the case might be and she remains in that situation for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and there's a special blessing for that kind of woman. But the woman who is looking for just, you know, the, the slightest thing, he makes me cry, I'm, I'm emotionally unstable and he doesn't respond to me or whatever, the, the, he didn't cut the air conditioner on when he came in last night or she's looking for khula. What she wants to be in the marriage for? Khula is an extreme situation. But be careful about it, sisters, because the Prophet ﷺ said, Allah curses the woman who asks for a divorce while she does not have justification for it. Yes, Jazakallah Khairi. If you live in another country with your husband away from your family, is it permissible for you to travel to your parents without a mahram? That is, we can only afford for one of us to go. Uh, this is a question, sisters, that you can, uh, this, you can get, have this answered on one of these here sites here because there's uh, uh, Sheikh Salman Auda, Sheikh Yusuf Qaradawi, uh, Sheikh, uh, Sheikh um, um, uh, um, Sheikh Salim Halali, there's many uh, different uh, scholars. Sheikh Ibn Jabreen, many of them, they have sites, and you can put this in and they will answer it. Or they already have fat fatawa already written. And also there's a set of books called Fatawa, which is, uh, you can get from Dar es Salaam. Uh, there's a book distributors. It's a set of fatawa. There are four books now. And I think they have a collection of over 3,000 fatawa. And it's by the... Uh, um, the um, the higher uh, um, level of ulama and fuqaha of Saudi Arabia, about five different ulama, they have collected these fatawa. So if you can get these books for your home, inshallah, you will find, inshallah, answer for that. Uh, sister says, I work in a large, I'm going to go through them quickly because it says 15 or 20 minutes. I'm going to see if I can s stretch it to 25 minutes. Uh, I work in a large company and uh, most social events, gatherings uh, uh, involve alcohol, held in parks, etc. I still have um, to interact with colleagues uh, in my career. What shall I do? Well, you have to tiptoe. You have to tiptoe through the minefield. There are circumstances that you cannot avoid sometimes. Maybe you need to think about a different occupation. Maybe that occupation is hazardous for you. Maybe it carries too much liability for you. Maybe it is not praiseworthy for you. 
Maybe there's something else better for you that you can do that earns you less money and less prestige. You have to decide that. But if it is the case that you need to stay there, then you have to tiptoe to the minefield, knowing sometimes that you're gonna step on something that's gonna blow up in your face. That's the, I'm being real with you about it. A Muslim woman must be very careful about her environment because her reputation is at stake all the time. And once your reputation is ruined, it's very difficult for you to get it back. What if a Muslim woman does not have a male to accompany her? I needed to go back to my country to see my family and I didn't have a mahram. Uh, that's the same answer. And also a sister mentioned to me that, you know, today there's a little um, trend that sisters are going to hajj with no mahram. It's very clear, sisters, you cannot make hajj without mahram. Now, from what I understand, there is a provision. Uh, and uh, the, the ulama and the fuqaha have made a provision like this, that if you are traveling in a group uh, and there is a, a legal mahram for you in that group, that group can be as a mahram for you if there is a person who one of the sisters in that group has mahram for her, uh, but you cannot be uh, uh, alone with that particular person, but there is some provision for that. But I think you need to really look into it and uh, examine it and don't just, you know, get your ticket, pay for it and just jump in a uh, go with a group and you're at the airport and Bismillah, I'm going to Hajj and you're walking all around every place and you got nobody escorting you. Because in that case, sister, you are in a situation where perhaps you nullify your Hajj because you didn't even look into the protection of the issue of Mahram. How did the wives of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi become so knowledgeable? They was married to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They, the Wahi was coming in front of them. And also, Allah blessed them to be people who they acclimated themselves and conformed themselves. That even when they were in error, Allah admonished them and they conformed. So Allah, He blessed them and He made them Ummahatul Mu'mineen, MashaAllah. One Islam Productions, an Islamic film studio established in Australia, is dedicated to producing films for all Muslims. Just some of the films by One Islam Productions. Children's programs, Islam for Me, We Remember Allah, Storytime and more. Educational films, Pray As You Have and Seen Me Pray, to Words, pray. Ramadan, Renewal Next. of Faith. Documentaries. We at One Islam Productions believe that Islam is precious and deserves to be presented in only the highest quality. Visit us at www.oneislam.net for more information. One Islam Productions, a film production company run by Muslims for Muslims.